piracy. It's as old as the sea itself. But the pirate legacy has been hijacked by Hollywood and romantic fiction. Pirates, we're told, are faintly noble, selfless independents, toiling for king and country. The real pirate story is much darker. Pirate lives were nasty, brutish, and short. Lives that for a brief moment in history terrorized the oceans, demanded the attention of the naval might of Europe, and then sank out of sight. Wherever there have been sea traders, there have been sea thieves. Controlling the sea meant controlling the world. But pirates were the worm in the apple of sea power. Even in the ancient world, coastal raiders constantly violated Greek and Roman ships. And wherever there were trade routes, pirates have always appeared to pick off weak and solitary ships on the vast and indefensible seas. By the 16th century, empires had become global and it was a field day for the sea wolves. Piracy was approaching its high water mark. And it was then that one of the most celebrated of all pirates first went to Rome. He called himself Blackbeard. His beard was black, which he suffered to grow an extravagant length. In time of action, he struck lighted matches under his hat, which appearing on each side of his face, made him altogether such a figure that imagination cannot form an idea of fury from hell to look more frightful. His real name is Edward Teach, though he also goes by such aliases as Tack, Thatch, Tash, and for some reason, Drummond. But even during his lifetime, all you needed to know was Blackbeard. He is psychopathically addicted to violence and he's as ferocious as his image, which features six loaded pistols, a cutlass, and a musket. More sinister still, Blackbeard is savagely unpredictable. It's how he rules, keeping everyone else on edge. Even a friendly card game is shaking hands with the devil. You never knew when Teach would go off, like he did when his first mate Israel Hands called his bluff. Is it a bad game you play, Hans? Born in Bristol, England about 1680, Blackbeard explodes into history in 1716 off the Carolinas and Virginia. He has his way with merchant shipping of all nations. In time, he is both the governor and the chief justice of Carolina in his pocket. In command of a flotilla of small ships and as many as 700 men, he captures a massive French frigate, and he rechristens her as Queen Anne's Revenge. She carries 40 guns and a crew of 300. At the peak of his power, he blockades the port of Charleston, South Carolina. Holding for ransom a local magistrate and his child, he keeps the town on its knees for four days. The outrage is too much. The governor of Virginia puts a price upon his head. By November 22nd, 1718, Teach is history. Though it takes five musket balls and 20 cutlass slashes, the last of which severs his head from his shoulders. And so, Blackbeard moves into legend, himself spectacularly dead, 13 of his crewmen hanged, and no treasure at all. The total elapsed time of his career? A little over two years. It's odd seeing Blackbeard come to this undistinguished end, for piracy started out as far more illustrious, a feature of British imperial policy. As early as the 16th century, English ships carried letters of mark, entitling them to attack, loot, sink, or capture ships belonging to all enemy nations. 
France, Holland, Portugal, and Spain, especially Spain, for such piracy was economic warfare. This was the period when the Caribbean was the Spanish lake, which was looked on by English sailors the way a lion looks on a herd of wildebeest. In effect, England licensed certain merchant captains to become lions. They called them privateers. It amounted to sanctioned plunder, a profitable if dangerous vocation. But one man's privateer is another man's pirate. How could you control a whole generation of well-trained privateers whose greatest weapon was their independence? The answer was, you couldn't. Said Admiral Nelson, the conduct of all privateers is, as far as I have seen, so near piracy that I wonder how any civilized nation can allow them. And when privateers became pirates, they have allegiance to nothing save their own purses and bellies and tankards. Still, privateering worked, and in the beginning at least, it gave the world its first great privateering hero, Sir Francis Drake. Sadly, he was also its last. Drake's career as a pirate was due to two things, global politics and Spanish gold. Finding the new world was a quest for gold, and from Columbus onward, the Spanish had mastered that quest. For nearly a century before Drake, they scarfed up Inca and Aztec precious metal to send back to Spain, but not before melting it down and reminting it into crudely fashioned coins of silver, pieces of eight, pesos, or gold coins called doubloons. Many men made their careers jumping Spanish treasure ships on the long voyage home. But only Drake tormented the Spanish so relentlessly that he earned the nickname El Drake, the dragon. Drake was an explosive cannonball of a man. A man full of vanity, ambition, pride, intense religious zeal, vehemently Protestant, vehemently anti-Spain. Spain is the great Catholic champion of the Pope, and he hates the Pope like poison. Drake was born near the coast in Devon in 1541. It was a time of building tension between Catholic Spain and Protestant England. Within his lifetime, the greatest invasion threat to England ever, the 1588 Spanish Armada, would be defeated by Drake, among others, on England's doorstep. But for Queen Elizabeth, she saw in the unknown Drake a certain strategic promise. In 1577, she commissioned his flotilla of five ships to wage economic terror against her enemy. Drake knew that where the silver came from was on the other side of the continent. That Pacific seaboard is unguarded. It's the soft underbelly of the Spanish Empire. So if you can get there, then uh, you can get to the, to, the, to the treasure at source. So he has this idea he will take a strong force of ships, he'll go around South America, he'll come up the other side and raid along that unguarded Pacific seaboard at will. On December 13th, 1577, Drake set off from the port of Plymouth on the south coast of England, heading into history. Two years later, coming home from attacks on Spanish imperial shipping and blown off course, he would become the first Englishman to circumnavigate the globe. The pirates' desire for gold drove them deeper and deeper into unknown worlds and uncharted seas. They pushed the envelope of navigation. Most of the men who opened up the South Seas began, like Sir Francis Drake, as pirates. Drake would always insist that he had letters from the Queen authorizing him to do what he was doing. Uh, no one ever saw his instructions, and so we don't know whether he had or not, but it's really immaterial. You, you did whatever you can get away with. You haven't got any laws of the sea in those days. Drake's flagship, the Golden Hind, was his only ship to complete the voyage. 
100 feet long and 18 wide, it was a floating city, though a cramped one. So here she is. She's a small ship crammed with 184 plus men. But within this small space, social distinctions are going to be very clearly kept. And so Drake lives aft there in his own great cabin, because he is the representative of the Queen. This is the crew's quarters. They don't go up there. They don't go up to the poop deck. Each man with his own chest lashed down to his favourite place, and that's where he will live, that's where he will sleep. In rough weather, he will move down to below to the gun deck and sleep between the guns. But that's the conditions that the, the serfs live under, and it's totally different from the conditions that the gentlemen and the captain live under. Ships were built on various levels for social reasons, to distinguish between the lower orders and the upper orders, and also for the very practical business that this was a fighting ship. And so from this upper level, men would be able to leap onto the decks of a ship that was being grappled. And from the lower level, the guns would fire away into the belly of the other ship. Trying to uncover the past using only the implements and conditions available then is called experimental archaeology. Twenty years ago, a reproduced Golden Hind set sail again. The captain of the new Golden Hind was Adrian Small. We found that he was a much better sea dog than we were. He did things, things with his ship that we found uh, very, very difficult to do. They wouldn't attempt to do long passages into the eye of the wind or against the wind like a modern yacht. They let the ship go off before the wind and just sail to another part of the ocean where they might get more favorable winds. But to reach the Pacific, there is one fearsome impediment that every ship must endure. At the tip of South America, the Straits of Magellan. The passage through Magellan Strait would be today considered quite a feat in any sailing vessel, let alone a period galleon. That is a tremendous feat to sail, and in the centuries that followed, sailing ships avoided going through the Strait of Magellan and preferred to go around Cape Horn. It takes six weeks, but Drake battles his way through the Strait and emerges into the relative calm of the Pacific. No English ship has done this before. Conquering the Straits gives him the one feature sought by every pirate since Drake sudden and overwhelming surprise. Ah! For weeks, he ravages the South American coast, falling upon one unsuspecting ship and town after another. And then, on March the 1st, 1579, Drake comes upon the fattest of Spanish treasure ships, the Cacafuego. Drake has heard about this ship, the Nuestra Señora de la Ascensión, which is working its way up to Panama, loaded with treasure from, from the silver mines. She's also famed to be a uh, very powerful ship. That's why she's nicknamed the Cacafuego, literally the ship fire. Cacafuego is a major warship and twice the size of the Golden Hind. Ordinarily, such an attack would be considered suicidal. And so here, Drake uses the second trick in every pirate's kit, deceit. What Drake does is he throws out a number of loaded wine jars full of water to slow him down, and crams on full canvas and starts moving towards the Cacafuego. And so the Cacafuego, this unknown vessel looks like a laboring merchantman. She's obviously traveling under full sail, but she's not making very good speed. So, in order to find out who she is, the Cacafuego turns round, comes back towards Drake, and comes alongside. And the captain of the Cacafuego hails this other ship. Who is she? What does she want? 
Drake's answer is surrender. Why should I surrender, laughs the captain of the Cacafuego. And for answer, Drake has one of his culverin fire which carries away the mizzen mast of the Cacafuego. <laughs> And while the captain is still wondering what the hell is going on, up from the decks of the Golden Hind appear all these armed men ready to swarm aboard, which they very quickly do. They grapple and get aboard. Cacafuego has no time to buy its guns, no time to arm its men. He's finished. It's a very short, sharp, brilliant engagement, and Drake has taken a superior vessel. It takes six days to reload the Cacafuego's treasure aboard the Golden Hind. And during all that time, the defeated and humiliated Spanish captain is treated to a great feast in Drake's cabin. Drake also had an inferiority complex. He's a man on the make, he's a man determined to work his way up and to show that he is just as great as the great nobleman of the realm. And so he is going to surround himself with all the trappings of wealth and splendor. And so when he has the captain of the Cacafuego and his officers on board, he entertains them here in the great cabin. The musicians play in the background and it's just as though he were a great nobleman holding court in the household of Queen Elizabeth. Worth about $20 million today, the Cacafuegos is among the richest prizes ever taken by pirating. On that treasure ship were 1,300 bars of silver and 14 chests of coin, plus uh, an unspecified amount of private treasure belonging to various merchants. It's a huge amount of money. This was the, his major haul of the whole trip. To give you some idea, when he got back to England, he was able to pay the backers of the expedition 4,700% return on their investment and provide the Queen with money which was the equivalent of a year's government expenditure. A lot of money. Drake himself kept 10,000 pounds and was knighted by Queen Elizabeth in 1581. He would die in 1596 the victim of disease on another privateering venture in the Caribbean. His career set a very high standard for every pilot that would follow him down the ages. A standard that would never be achieved again. Prompted by Drake's success, hundreds of would-be privateers take up the trade. But a dearth of target ships renders their valor increasingly desperate. In time, they descend to the level of bloodthirsty opportunists, terrorists, really, who constantly operate under false flags, who seldom blink at betrayal and treachery, and who routinely kill to eradicate witnesses. For all that, they seldom hit it big. The Spanish learn to hoard their treasure in highly defended ports along the Caribbean, the coast known as the Spanish Main. Even more depressing, they bring their gold home in great treasure fleets, a defensive tactic that is never cracked by pirates or privateers. People in England tried to make money out of privateering, but it's very difficult when you're six months sailing distance. They hoped they'd um, one day find a richly laden galleon floating towards them totally undefended, or a golden city in the jungle, but more often they actually found a small sloop trading hides or cocoa. These were desperate times on sea and land, and many were driven to theft. In London, every coach coming into the city from the south in one week was robbed. If robbery was that common in England, imagine how easy it must have seemed in the Caribbean. In any case, in the post-Drake world, the warm and protective Carib Sea had become a vast pirate's den. Most pirates were sailors who would jump ship or indentured servants who would run away from their contracts on sugar plantations. That is, they were felons, many facing capital punishment. 
Those first runaways gave us the term buccaneer, land-based raiders. Their name is derived from bouquin, the native word for the rack on which meat was smoked. Sleeping rough in the jungles, they originally made their way selling cured pork to passing Spanish mariners. It was a way of life quickly discarded once they noticed how easy it would be to plunder those same ships. They became buccaneers. In the beginning, the island of Hispaniola was a major buccaneer base. To the Spanish, they were a nuisance that needed dealing with. The buccaneers were chased off Hispaniola by the Spanish and they became pirates and they were joined by an assorted bunch of English and Dutch soldiers and seamen and deserters and together formed this terrifying bunch of young men. They were mostly in their 20s or 30s. Oddly, it was their apprenticeship in hunting the fast and elusive wild boar that made the buccaneers good pirates. Hunting the stationary helmsman was hardly sport. The weapon that I'm handling is called a fusil buccanier, a buccaneer's musket, from the French. This one dates from about 1650 or 1660. Its distinguishing characteristic is it the huge length of its barrel. As you see, this one is nearly six feet long. With such a weapon, a skilled marksman could bring down a wild pig on the run, or he could pick the helmsman off of an enemy's deck. The buccaneers were good shots. They were very good shots. They were masters in the use of small arms, the first who gave it any attention. Surprise, deceit, and a dead hand at the wheel. Basic ingredients for crippling a ship. On this occasion, the pirates used canoes and paddled straight up to the windward side of the ship. Using long-barreled muskets, they shot the helmsman and the crew working the sails, causing the ship to fall away from the wind with her sails flapping. Firing continuously, they rowed up under the stern and with further shots cut through the main sheet so the ship was totally disabled. Hiding in the jungles and making their way scavenging off the land, the buccaneers were inventing guerrilla warfare. They used whatever they had to hand, only recycled and retooled for aggression and violence. Armed to the teeth, excessively armed, he's got two flintlock pistols, he's got two cutlasses, and probably tucked away in a pocket somewhere, he's got a couple of hand grenades to throw on deck to cause maximum terror. And he's got here a jacket covered with pitch or tar, which gives some sort of protection from sword wounds. And uh, you can see if you sort of saw into that, it uh, provides some sort of protection. How does it actually feel in all that gear? Extremely uncomfortable, hot and heavy. They were battle-hardened terrorists, really. They weren't nice people. They were quite capable of using their weapons. They were extremely accurate shots. They would have been good at sword play. They would have been effective with cutlasses. Uh, they were a nasty and terrifying lot of people. The pistol was the boarding firearm of the pirate. Good for one shot. Bang, and then, because it was a big, heavy thing, you threw it at the enemy. As soon as your enemy is about 10 feet away from you, that was the preferred distance. But at that range, they were deadly effective. Well, let's see how seriously we've inconvenienced our enemy here. It's gone right in there, and it's uh, come out right there. The problem, of course, was that it would carry a piece of your shirt, your coat, in with it, and although they might be able to dig the ball out, they would never get the fragments of garment, with the result that the wound would certainly fester. You'd probably die of gangrene if the bullet didn't kill you outright. 
there was no anaesthetic, there was no antiseptics. And from bitter experience, they knew that unless the limb was amputated, it would usually mortify, as they would call it, go gangrenous, get infected. And probably the only effective way of dealing with a, a severe injury of the limb was to, to amputate it. Poor Siemens brought down, let's say, with a compound fracture of his leg from a cannonball. We'd put him on the operating table. His mates would put a bit of leather between his teeth to stop him screaming too much. Another man to hold up the leg. Now I've got to try and stop the bleeding as much as possible. If I had anybody skilled, if I had a surgeon's mate, I'd get him to press on the femoral artery. That would reduce the bleeding considerably. Probably I wouldn't have anybody as skilled as that, so I'd put a tourniquet round the thigh to stop the bleeding. Very painful, but still effective. And then I'd have to fashion the skin flaps and cut through the muscle so that the skin flaps would flap back over the stump of the bone, like so. Having done that, I would make my skin incision using my amputation knife, as long and as sharp as I can get. Cut through the skin flaps, cut through the muscle, discard my knife, pick up my saw, saw through the tibia and fibula, the two bones of the, below the knee, the whole thing should have taken 30 to 60 seconds, if I'm skillful. Pick up the main arteries with forceps, pull them down, tie them off with a piece of silk or a piece of thread. Put a dressing on, take off the tourniquet, end the procedure. give the patient a couple of opium tablets, plus or minus a good slug of rum, take him off the table. Still, even the one-legged ones were lucky. Most amputees died of gangrene within a few days. A pirate boarding party meant all sorts of lethal shrapnel slicing through the air. One of the most dangerous weapons was also one of the smallest. The grenade, a favorite weapon of the pirates. Spherical cast iron ball, about five inches around, loaded with five ounces of gunpowder. Fused with a wooden fuse, hollow with a compound in it, driven home, and sealed with wax so that no stray spark could get into it. When it was lit, it took about six seconds to go off, and you could throw it about 90 feet. The blunderbuss, a favorite shipboard weapon. We're told it was Blackbeard's favorite. It was loaded with a handful of pistol balls, and when it was fired, it would create absolute devastation over a broad area of decks. It had to be fired like this, from this position, so that when it recoiled, and its recoil was massive, it would be cushioned that way. If you made the mistake of putting it to your shoulder, it would break your shoulder. But all the firearms were one-shot weapons, then they had to be reloaded. The backbone of any boarding action was the cutlass, a thrusting weapon or a cutting weapon used over and over. It was short so that you didn't get the blade hung up in the rigging if you were handling it on deck. And also you could swing it in a tight-packed group of men. Pirates constantly face better armed and outfitted foes. Strangely, however, they often quailed in the face of, what was it? Possibly the pirates' desperate valor? This meant the pirates were continuously capturing new and better equipment and improving their arsenal. And since they usually stole boats as well as loot, it can be said truly, they got their money for nothing and their ships for free. Pirates, on the whole, preferred small, fast ships. I mean, I think one of the problems with the movies is, in the past, they've always shown these vast pirate galleons. In fact, the records show that the pirates preferred small brigs and ideally what were called sloops, which we would call today a gaff cutter, which was a single-masted vessel in those days with a very big mainsail. And they were very fast and they were very big. They were often up to 70 foot in size and could carry a crew of 50 to 100 men. Once they'd stolen a ship, 
the pilots would refit it like drag racers, customizing it for speed. And the place to start was with the sails. To make yourself go fast air, you put up more canvas, but you would try and get sails that spill the wind quickly. If you can spin the wind quickly and get rid of it, then you get more wind in and you increase your air flow. And that's one way of, other than increasing the sail air, it's, it's another way of increasing your speed. A sail is like an aeroplane wing, really. Only a few modifications and you're overtaking a lumbering merchantman or skipping away from the Royal Navy. Speed was survival. But the ship would want to be in a good state itself. You know, if it's seaworthy and, uh, and fast, if possible. If they could find a faster one, I'm sure they'd use it. But speed wasn't everything. You had to know where you were going. People like to equate uh, these early ships with space capsules. But you know, the space capsule has ground support, communications, and a full range of people assisting them, even though it's, it's quite far away. When these ships left, they literally were entirely on their own. Chip Reynolds has skippered replica galleons and knows firsthand the importance of navigation and the navigational uncertainties faced by early mariners. This instrument, the cross staff, was essential to tracking the position of latitude. It would be used by sighting celestial objects, the sun, uh, stars. To sail the Atlantic safely, Mariners would take sightings of the elevation of the sun each day, allowing them to follow a single line of latitude all the way across. These waters were uncharted, and so after weeks, sometimes months of sailing, they faced another dragon, the shoals and reefs that protect the shore. The lead line was really one of the most critical pieces of navigational equipment to transatlantic crossings. The mate or another crew member would be standing on the channel and cast the lead into the bottom. And then they can read the depth right off the line. Even in calm seas and on sandy bottoms, a ship will soon break up. In wild seas, it can break up in minutes. If they ended up on a sandbank, or if they ended up coming ashore unexpectedly, their vessel was ruined, they were marooned, and probably dead. Once they had a fast ship, most 17th century pirates sooner or later made their way to British Port Royal Jamaica, the cosmic center for all manner of buccaneers, privateers, and pirates. Anyone said to be, in their own words, living on account. They came to Port Royal because the British knew that for Spain, piracy was not just some swashbuckling inconvenience. It struck at the very idea of a colony, its umbilical cord. At heart, what made colonies work was maritime commerce. If a colony was to be any good at all, it had to be good for the mother country, and that meant a steady stream of goods and profits crossing the Atlantic. Not for nothing was British Jamaica smack in the middle of the Spanish lake. Port Royal officials were said to be easy touches for letters of mark, and almost any reprobate with a stolen ship could get one. Anything bad for Spain was good for England. Privateering was an ideal start-up trade for a new colony. It required very little in the way of capital investment, and it offered very quick returns. Though the islanders gained security and the buccaneers gained access to what was the best port and the best market for prize goods in the Caribbean. What happens is really quite amazing. Here we are sitting on a, at the end of a peninsula that surrounds perhaps one of the seventh, the seventh largest natural harbour in the world, which has no water, has no other amenities to support life, and yet still becomes the, the launching port for maritime terrorism, which is really what the buccaneers were. They were licensed terrorists. Port Royal by 1692 is a town of some 8,000 persons, certainly much larger than New York even became 20 years later, and a crossroads of the Asian, African, and European continents, a melting pot, a cosmopolitan city. 
Port Royal became a year-round pirate carnival. They swarmed here by the thousands, captains looking for crews, crews looking for ships. A Port Royal rendezvous was at heart a great boozy blowout. A priest, newly come from England, saw the town as essentially irredeemable. Since the majority of the population consists of pirates, cutthroats, whores, and some of the vilest persons in the whole world, I felt my presence there was of no permanent use. Turning his back on the town, he left Port Royal to its own devices. The pirate lifestyle was undeniably attractive. But that very freedom from responsibility, from possessions, complicates pirate history. Pirates were not good nesters, and they mostly drank up their profits. So pirate artifacts are hard to come by. But not at Port Royal. Here, nearly everything was touched by a pirate. Well, these are wine bottles, or onion bottles, as they are called. The late 17th century, you find wine bottles all over the place, in vast quantities. See, a lot of the wine was weak stuff, and they'd sooner drink the wine than drink the bad water. But imagine it would have been more healthy to drink the wine and the water. Of course, if you overdid it, that's another thing. Now, we have some pewter tankards here. It's patterned off the work of a silversmith. You know, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a poor man's silver. And the thumb piece here on the lid is interesting. It's a Bacchus head, God of Drink, and a very elaborate um, handle. Very nice piece. Probably French. <laughs> After the drinking comes the cure for the hangovers, the pharmaceutical bottles. This is a little collection here of drug bottles. And also they have to, to go with these things, the syringes, you see? And this is a nice big one. I was... Don't ask me what the medicine was that went to it. They had all sorts of strange things that they took. Today, Clay pipes, which we find. There's the thousands. Everybody smoked in those days. See, a pipe was very cheap. You go into a tavern, they give you a, a pipe bowl. You drop the pipe, you'll be a very delicate thing. I mean, you'll be talking and flourishing, brandishing your hand, snap, goes the stem, you get another pipe. This one has been smoked. You can see the arm uh, where the tobacco has burnt it. You can easily match up the maker's um, names with the initials on the pipe, L.E., Llewellyn Evans, it's a Welsh pipe maker. The Welsh connection is strong, for Port Royal's foremost pirate was a Welshman who arrived here at the very beginning, 1655, when the English captured Jamaica from Spain. Just 19 years old, he arrives at a time when there's a need for young privateers to harry the Spanish. He is given a boat and set loose. He is called Henry Morgan. Henry Morgan was, in a way, the man that the buccaneers were all waiting for. One of his uncles was a major general. The other was a lieutenant colonel, who actually became lieutenant governor of Jamaica. So he was, uh, he knew about military tactics. It was in his blood, as it were. Starting with a single tiny vessel carrying letters of mark against Spain, Captain Morgan joined numerous raids against Spanish Cuba and Central America. Though militarily successful, the raids were far less profitable than buccaneers had come to expect. They usually concentrated on attacking towns which lay outside the main treasure routes, which were much less well defended. Some towns had been plundered three, four, five, six times in the 1660s, and clearly these people were running into diminishing returns. After a decade as a coastal raider, Morgan had designs on a prestige target, Panama City, the treasury of Spain's Pacific coast. The Spanish considered Panama safe because to get there, 
they knew raiders would have to round the tip of the continent. They were wrong. Panama was chosen for two reasons. The buccaneers were pretty sure they'd find masses of gold and silver there. And the second thing was it had a sort of symbolic reason. It was the great Spanish city in the center of America. And if they could capture it and better still burn it to the ground, it would, it would uh, wipe out Spanish influence for a time and be very shaming for the Spanish. For Spain, the Caribbean had become tiresome, what with all those English privateers about. But the Pacific coast, that was protected by 80 miles of dank and tangled jungle. Only a madman would attempt that. And so the Welsh madman, Morgan, puts together a flotilla of 38 ships, 2,000 men, the meanest and largest soldier of fortune outing ever. His plan is bold, and the odds are stacked against him. They would overwhelm the Spanish fort on the Atlantic side of the Isthmus. From there, they would row in small boats up the Chagres River, cross the remaining jungle on foot, and surprise the Pacific Spaniards from behind. The Dutch surgeon and buccaneer Alexandra Esquemeling was there. As we went further up the river, we heard Indians howling in the distance and crying, Ha, Peros, a la selva! Go to the jungle, ye dogs! None of us knew what terrors lay ahead. It sounds a good plan, but it isn't. The river gets too shallow too fast. Soon they are slogging through mud and hacking through the undergrowth. I think it's impossible for us really to understand you know, the conditions they were facing. There were clouds of mosquitoes biting them all the time, uh, all sorts of nasty creatures. There will be leeches clinging onto their uh, feet as they went through the water. Not only that, stragglers are constantly being picked off by the Indians. Settlers abandon their plantations, stripping them of provisions and livestock, even poisoning their wells. The invaders are facing starvation. Now Morgan has another idea. They would eat their own gloves, belts, and shoes. They slice the leather into strips, beating it till it is wafer thin, then they boil it. The Dutchman is squemeling is appalled. Some persons who were never out of their mother's kitchens may ask how these pirates could swallow and digest these pieces of leather. To them, I say, if they ever experienced such famine as the buccaneers did, they would certainly do the same thing. At the end of their nine-day trek, Morgan's bold plan had consumed 800 lives, over a third of his original force. Exhausted, shaken, and depressed, Morgan's men stagger out of the thickets and blink in the rude sunlight. Before them, the great Panama. But the Spanish are waiting, 2,000 strong. Luckily for Morgan, only 300 of them are soldiers. The rest are farmers, civilians, and servants selected to fill out the ranks. For Morgan's part, he still has four squadrons of professional killers. Worse, he has a group of French marksmen who are deadly at long range. Morgan sends one of his squadrons to capture a hill which he sees overlooks the battlefield and the Spanish 
think that he's actually retreating and broke ranks and started to attack in total chaos. are determined that nothing of value be left. Most of the treasure is carted off or hidden. Adopting a scorched earth policy, they even lay waste to most of their own city. Panicking, Morgan's army sees its dreams of avarice going up in smoke. Morgan's men torture their captives, trying to uncover as much gold as possible. But they miss the biggest prize. Just ahead of the invaders, a monk hides the cathedral's massive golden altar under a coat of whitewash. Still wet, the altar is overlooked. They came away with uh, 175 mules loaded with silver ingots and gold, something like uh, two million pounds, three million dollars, which divided between over a thousand men didn't come to very much. And, and there was a lot of aggravation at the end of it that Morgan had cheated them. They felt that uh, the men didn't get what they deserved. History is silent on just how much booty Morgan pocketed for himself. Is there ever honor among thieves? But this cache of silver from the Port Royal Church is rumored to descend from Morgan's audacious Panama raid. Morgan leaves Chagres for Jamaica in March 1671. He returns to a changed world, a world that is no place for audacious raids and patriotic violence. England was at peace with Spain. To mollify her, Morgan was arrested and taken to London for trial. But popular opinion preceded him. He found himself a hero. He was knighted and sent back to Port Royal as the new Lieutenant Governor, Sir Henry Morgan. <laughs> Trouble was, Morgan was now expected to suppress his old comrades, the men who made his career on the Spanish main. He was a great buccaneer leader, but he was absolutely not a great bureaucrat. And, of course, he was expected to attend council meetings, and he didn't. And he just took to drink uh, and having a good time with his mates in the, in the local taverns. It's really sad. His, his last few years, he was very ill. He was drinking far too much and just died peacefully on his ranch. His doctor said he died of drink and, and staying up too late. He was one of the few buccaneers to come to a relatively peaceful end. 
Morgan died on August the 25th, 1688, after 13 years on the right side of the law. It killed him, apparently. His funeral featured a 22-gun salute from all the ships in Port Royal Harbor. That fusillade was a mere taste of what the wickedest city on earth would face just four years later, on June 7, 1692. Built on a sandy spit of land, it was rocked by an earthquake and tidal wave and slid into the sea. The watery grave is all that remains of the pirate capital and the 2,000 who perished with her. As Port Royal slipped under the waves, the golden age of piracy was reaching its peak. It's no wonder sea traders were called merchant venturers. You never knew for sure, what with storms, unreliable charts, or pirates, that your ship would ever come in. Pirates of the period 1680 to 1725 were at war with every country on the face of the earth. We estimate that there were between five and 10,000 individuals involved in piracy one way or another under the command of 70 different captains. With no home port, pirates began to range far and wide. From the 1690s onward, no corner of the globe, no trade route was totally guaranteed. Now it was the trade routes from Africa loaded with ivory and dazzling gems that caught the pirate imagination. Or the fragrant casks of spices and silks from India and Persia and the Moluccas. That was the stuff of dreams. It was a good time to be a pirate. World trade was expanding into exotic markets. But for most of the 17th and 18th centuries, the great world navies, British, Spanish, Dutch, and French, were at each other's throats. They had no time to protect their merchant vessels, and no time for pirates. That's when the old idea of privateering was dusted off. This time not as a weapon against shipping, but against pirates. And the first man to try this was called William Kidd. A Scotsman living in New York, he serves as a royalist privateer with distinction and marries well. He uses these contacts to secure a commission to rove the East Indies, relieve pirate ships of their booty, and return the loot to America for the colonial government. Next. He'd need seasoned veterans, men who aren't squeamish or finicky. He finds them in the quayside taverns and ordinaries of New York. He finds his old privateering crew, in fact. Gunner's mate. I'm not sure that pirate hunting was all that they had in mind. He recruits crewmen. Among them are men that he knows to be pirates. Some of those men were sailors who had run away with his own ship ten years earlier. Would he have hired them if he had honest intentions in mind? My name is William Kidd when I sailed, when I sailed. My name is William Kidd when I sailed. On September 6th, 1696, Kidd set sail. His is a motley crew, 152 dangerous men in route eastward to do the king's work. This is no patient and forgiving crew, and conditions aboard Kidd's ship Adventure Galley are terrible. Remember, this is a time that even when ships were good, they were bad. 
as the magisterial Dr. Johnson understood. No man will be a sailor who has contrivance enough to get himself into a jail. For being in a ship is being in jail with the chance of being drowned. A man in jail has more room, better food, and commonly better company. Now, of course, here we have the forecastle And the ship's galley. The irony, of course, is that it was only in pleasant conditions with sunshine and, and that nice, easygoing situations that you would actually have hot food. Something like this, where you really needed the hot food, as you can see, it would be impossible to maintain the fire, and you're living off of uh, cold gruel and a hunk of bread. Yeah. The bread would usually be uh, infested with either weevils or maggots, and it's my understanding that Royal Navy men preferred it when it was infested with maggots, on account of the weevils left a bitter aftertaste. <laughs> Kids men, as an extra bit of a treat, would have a piece of cheese as part of their ration. But even that uh, had its own special horrors because there was a long, thin, and nasty worm that dwelt in the bowels of the cheese. Uh, that was particularly wretched and horrendous and vile tasting. For this crew especially, all work and no prey got old way too soon. They began to murmur and complain. When one is a bit too vocal, kid flies into a rage. Next day, the man is buried at sea. He was a hard driving, strong willed captain. The kind of strong willed captain that could easily cause a crew to mutiny. On the other hand, the kind of strong willed captain who would often succeed. Kid is now at large with scant prospects on the vast Indian Ocean. Despairing of finding a pirate ship to attack and its booty to confiscate in the name of the law, he fixes on the idea of boarding the very next ship that appears. And that is the Quida Merchant, an undefended ship in the lucrative India trade. Kid knows it to be a protected vessel, but flying a false flag, he seizes her anyway. It would be his greatest mistake. The Quida's owner has connections. The India trade threatens to boycott Britain unless the Admiralty puts a stop to Kidd. But for the moment at least, Kidd has a worthy cargo. Silk, muslin, calico, sugar, and opium. William Kidd, pirate hunter, had become Captain Kidd, pirate. At heart, the Kidd tale raises an enduring question about the real adversary of many pirates, the changing winds of British colonial and imperial policy. The government had put him in the role of ship stealer. Lacking legitimate ships to plunder, what else could he do? Off Madagascar, Kidd abandons his old ship in favor of the Quida, which he renames Adventure's Prize. By the time he returns to North America, London's East India Company and the Crown are calling for his head. Kidd's response is to propagate rumors that he buried treasure all over the world. In the South China Sea, in the Caribbean, and even in British North America. None is ever found. Kid is a hunted and haunted man. What he needs is time. Plainly, he could defend himself in any sort of fair trial. After all, everyone knows the Sir Henry Morgan saga. Kid, too, could well come back from the courts a hero. Meanwhile, his wealth would be safe underground. Kidd abandons his great ship at Hispaniola and sails a small sloop back to New York. At last, in 1699, he fetches up on Gardner's Island off Long Island Sound. And it is here some claim 
that bits of the kid treasure still exist. This is where it all began. All the marvelous treasure hunting stories that have entertained us through childhood. For it's here that in 1699, Captain Kidd's buried treasure. It's perhaps the most famous buried treasure of all time. But Kidd will never see his treasure or Gardner's Island again. Arrested, he is on his way to London's infamous Newgate prison. The faintest echo of his glorious world still reverberates in a single surviving artifact. This is a small piece of what was then known as cloth of gold, silk with gold thread woven through it. Well, according to Gardner family tradition, Kidd was so grateful for a dinner of roast pork that Mrs. Gardner had prepared for him that he gave her this silk cloth of gold and that it was then made into dresses for her daughters and that a portion of one of these dresses was kept as a family heirloom. In London, Kidd is convicted of piracy. On May 23rd, 1701, 200,000 people come to execution dock on the banks of the Thames to witness Kidd's last breath. Not a few are hoping he'll reveal where he buried his loot. But he is drunken and sullen to the end. Kidd's life was a record of bad choices and constant and bitter violence. Said a member of parliament, I thought him only a knave. I now know him to be a fool as well. Many a felonious sailor had met his end in the gibbet, a sort of metal cage to hold a hangman's bones. The dangling man was meant as a warning to all incoming seamen. Kid's bones guarded the entrance to the Thames for four years. Plainly, there were hazards in going on account as a pirate. But this was an age when you could swing for stealing a loaf of bread or a handkerchief. To many, there seemed little reason not to be a pirate. At least that kept you out of the clutches of the press gangs, thugs who roamed every harbor, brutally kidnapping crewmen for service in the Royal Navy. There was 850 men uh, in this ship, and 60% were not on board a class of ship like this voluntarily. They were um, seconded, uh, and it was legal to do that. They were pressed men, hence the press gangs. The ship's company would go ashore and take a quantity of people off the streets to bring them on board. And that's where they stayed. So there were 600 people on board not wanting to be here. And so in order to get them to do what you wanted them to do, uh, you had to have a strict discipline regime. And there was. For an example, if you had a situation where you had theft on board, then the perpetrator would have probably run the gauntlet. Running the gauntlet would have been, uh, you have 50% uh, of the ship's company on one side of the ship, 50% of it on the other side in a, in a row, and the perpetrator would have been invited or ordered or actually, <laughs> at the end of a bayonet, uh, would be uh, tasked to go from one end to the other through these row of people. Each person was given a, a rope's end, and as the poor man went through, he was then whacked across the back or the legs or the head or wherever uh, until he got to the other end. And they all felt empowered, and the bloke really felt uh, as if he, he, he deserved what he got because everybody felt better, except for the perpetrator, of course. Flogging was the great enforcer on the high seas, by way of the cat and nine tails. Each sailor to be flogged had to make the instrument of his own torture by unbraiding a length of line into its three strands, and then each of those into three more, nine tails. But cats could only be used once, lest their bloody strands infect and probably kill their next victim. Oof. Oof. 
everybody knew exactly where your boundaries were. And if you crossed those boundaries, then you'd be punished if you were found out. And that actually was a very good, strict way of controlling 60% of the ship's company that didn't want to be here. So they knew where their boundaries were, rather like children. There was only one defense, jumping ship to become a pirate. Thousands of Royal Navy and merchant seamen made this choice. One gang, for example, that was composed not only of Englishmen, Irishmen, Scots, and Welsh, but there were also Frenchmen, Dutchmen, Swedes, North Germans, Belgians, uh, colonials of all different ancestries, Native Americans from two separate tribes, and some 50 uh, persons of African heritage, either former slaves, runaway slaves, or uh, Freema. There were many negotiable and lucrative commodities trading on the seas. In the 17th and 18th centuries, humans were among those goods. So slavers were valuable ships to intercept. Most slaves were sold on, but some could join the pirate crew. For a black man who was captured by pirates meant that he had a unique opportunity. Because on board pirate vessels, blacks were treated as equals. We know that some blacks were elected as officers and captains of predominantly white crews. Some of the most successful pirates uh, in history were black men. And it's a terrible irony that during the early 18th century, perhaps the most powerful place for a black man in the Western world was the deck of a pirate ship. Oddly, because a pirate crew was the haunt of cutthroats and villains, a sort of truce settled over shipboard life, centered around an informal pact. Peace, pistols and cutlass, clean and fit for service. Some pirate voyages started with each man signing such a contract. No striking one another on board, but every man's quarrels to be ended on shore at sword and pistol. Every man has a vote in the affairs of the moment. We're dealing with the first democracy in some sense. Every man to be called fairly in turn by list on board of prizes, meaning everybody gets a proper share. The lights and candles to be put out at 8 o'clock at night. No striking one another on board. If you had a beef, you took your squabble ashore. No man to talk of breaking up their way of living till each had shared 1,000 pounds. Here at last was a real floating republic, every man having a say in his destiny. And when they came to choose a destination, many opted for the Caribbean. The Caribbean was an ideal hunting ground for the pirates. In the first place, uh, the weather was a damn sight better than the North Sea or the North Atlantic, and pirates like good weather. But the main thing was it was on major trade routes. Uh, ships coming from Africa uh, across to America all went through the Caribbean. And for a pirate on the run, and of course they were always on the run from the authorities, it provided literally thousands of hiding places. Nassau on the island of New Providence in the Bahamas had become the new pirate base. Here they came between rovings to rest and parcel out their ill-gotten gains. Sooner or later, every vicious pirate passed through this harbor. So far, their ranks had been filled by a certain predictable class. The poor, the outsider, the social and political misfit, the maltreated sailor. But there was another disaffected and powerless group to draw from as well. Women. One was particularly nasty. Her name is Anne Bonny. Anne Bonny was the illegitimate daughter of a solicitor. She rather disgraced her father by running off with um, a man who describes as being not worth a groat. I think he was a sailor and disappointed her parents' expectations. And it also mentions in the story that she had a ferocious temper. I mean, there's one anecdote that she actually sliced off a woman's nose in an argument. In 
In New Providence, Anne abandons her bland sailor husband in favor of a racy pirate called Calico Jack Rackham. The appeal of piracy to women would have been huge. I mean, it was all about escape. It was about escaping the confines of home and children. And young girls would often dream about running off to sea in the same way that boys would. In no time, Anne and Calico Jack steal a ship in Nassau Harbor and sail off on account. From one of their first prizes, a Dutch ship, they take on board a handsome young crewman who catches Anne's fancy. But something seems faintly unusual about the lad, and he is odd. In fact, he's a girl. A circumstance she confides only to Anne. The crewman's name is Mary Reed. One of the points of similarity between Mary Reed and Anne Bonny's story is that Mary Reed was also illegitimate. She, however, was raised as a boy from birth because her brother had died. Her brother, who was legitimate, had died. And her mother was sort of passing Mary off as her brother to her mother-in-law in order to get some sort of family income and support. And at the age of 13, her mother had fallen on hard times and sends Mary off to be a kind of serving man, serving boy, to a French woman. Fed up with the circumscribed life allowed to 18th century women, Mary Reed ran away to the war of Spanish succession, dashing as a cavalryman through Flanders. After that fray, she posed as a sailor on a Dutch ship, the very one that brought her to Calico Jack and Anne Bonny. The question is, how did she manage to conceal herself from her crewmates for so long? Nicky Alford has been sailing tall ships for 10 years. I think disguise would have been very difficult. I guess they could have cut their hair short, worn loose clothing. Mostly it's your hands and your feet get very rough and worn. Everyone runs barefoot everywhere and it's all rope. And your hands, of course, from pulling on ropes, you get, it's like a friction burn and you get very hard calluses on the palms of your hands and on your fingers. That's about the most change, apart from, of course, big upper body muscles. Everyday life would have been quite hard, the actual personal side of it, like going to the toilets. You'd possibly get away with it at night by creeping up forward onto what were the heads, is the cat heads, they're big wooden pieces of timber where the anchors are hung and hung yourself off there like the rest of the men just go at night rather than in the day at sea Bonnie and Reed are beyond the reach of society's conventions they could be as non-conformist and as fierce as unladylike as they pleased off the coast of Jamaica all three are captured with only the women putting up much resistance the men are drunk Later, Anne scorned Jack Rackham. If you had fought like a man, she said, you need not have been hanged like a dog. They were as fierce as any of the male pirates that you can imagine. When they were finally trapped by a British frigate and their ship was being overwhelmed, their crew fled below decks, leaving only the women on deck, fighting like demons. Anne and Mary are brought to trial at the Admiralty Court, Spanish Town, Jamaica. This was news. Well, when Mary Reed and Anne Bonny were tried in 1720, it caused a huge sensation, both in Jamaica and back in England. 
It was the first time that there was hard concrete evidence that women actually had been pirates. I mean, there was plenty of sort of stories about them and ballads about them, but this was the first time that we knew they really existed. And it was as if a fantasy had been made real. Evidence offered in court passes almost immediately into legend and folklore. Just one and thirty-six months she braved the tempest cold and always done her duty did the The witnesses seem to sense they are part of history. Both of the women were very profligate, cursing and swearing much. They did not seem to be kept or detained by force. The two women wore men's trousers. Each of them had a machete and a pistol and cursed and swore at the men to murder me. I knew they were women by the largeness of their breasts. Neither Anne nor Mary testify in their defense. Why? Because they have a trump card. They can plead their bellies. They were tried. They were sentenced to hang. But they couldn't hang the ladies because they were both pregnant. And under English common law, that was something that you couldn't do. And so they escaped the hangman's news. Mary Reed had her infant, and they both died of a fever in the tropics in Jamaica. And Bonnie, no one knows what happened to her, but she didn't hang. Actually, sworn testimony at pirate trials is a surprisingly sharp focused source of information. It shows quite clearly, for instance, just how pirates manage their attacks. And as the age of piracy progressed, pirate tactics got refined and improved. But their methods are still there, part of the public legal record. In the Caribbean, there was a standard method of attack. The pirate ship would see a ship on the horizon it would come closer and it would shadow that ship for quite a while, working out how many men there were on board, well, it, whether it was well armed, whether it was worth attacking. They would then move up closer, probably flying friendly flags in order to lull the crew into a sense of security. They might even come right up close and ask for water or something like that. And then at the last moment, all the crew would appear on deck, maximum noise, maximum terror, Most merchant ships in the Caribbean had tiny crews with perhaps a few token cannon. A pirate ship was loaded with men. Even quite small pirate ships had crews of 50, 60, very often two or 300 men. It was a totally unequal battle. Intimidation was a very real weapon, and the pirate ensign was meant to make the blood run cold. Bones, skeletons, skulls, crossed femurs, sometimes a bony hand. They were all symbols of death. Death being what the victim could expect if he didn't surrender pronto. The earliest pirate flag was a plain red field. The Jolie Rouge, the French called it, meaning the pretty red. The English called it the bloody flag. It was in use until about 1700, at which point it was replaced by the black flag. The black flag. This one, the classic skull and crossbones, used by several pirates in the early 1700s, but all pirates made their own flag with their own variations. The hope, as always, was that the conquest could be made without a shot being fired. But if not... There are so many ways a cannonball can wreak havoc. Colin Harriet has studied them all.
Well, as you can see, the cannonball hasn't come right the way through the wall of wood. It's stuck in there, but it has pushed out these great big jagged splinters, which are just about to detach themselves. And that's only with a six pound arm ball. Imagine the devastation of a 24 pounder or a 32 pound cannonball coming through a wall of wood like this. A shower of splinters everywhere, absolute hell on earth. But I think we're going to have to try again, and this time we're going to put a little bit more gunpowder down the gum. We're slammering a bit harder for you. Well, I suppose we're about 25, 30 yards, fairly close for a small gun. This was the range that these would be firing at, which gives us the ability to fire with a flat trajectory or point blank. The phrase point blank now would come to mean firing very close, but in its original form it meant to fire at a flat trajectory. So you had to be fairly close. And that's what we're going to do. Yes. Now that's more like it. These are the splinters I've been telling you about. Imagine those flying everywhere. Look at the point on them, jagged, horrible. Kill anything. The whole point of a cannonball is to smash through the hull, to cause damage. It's not the cannonball which kills people, although a cannonball hitting somebody will make a nasty mess of them. It's the splinters, the debris. They are the real killers. The cannonball does the smashing and the splinters do the rest. Mother Kerr, give him fire! Pirates knew the score. They were always facing dangerous weather. It's why there are so many peg legs in pirate history and in pirate fiction, like Long John Silver. Still, that must have seemed a small price to pay for the possibility, at least, of vast riches. Many were willing to take the gamble, with one interesting and surprising hedge on that bet. One of the most surprising things about pirates is the medical insurance scheme which pirates established if they lost limbs in battle. And the convention was that the right hand or the right arm was the most valuable, so if you lost that, you got 500 pieces of eight, the left hand was 400 pieces of eight, so much for a leg, and if you lost an eye, you just got 100 pieces of eight. It says a lot for the way they determined their rule in a, a very undemocratic age. It's notions like that that give pirate history its schizophrenic character. Were they brave and noble, or just bloody and bloody-minded? important not to think of the pirates as heroes. They shouldn't be. They were hard, brutal, and vicious men. While many of the gangs were described as decent and humane even by their victims, there were crews out there who would have made extraordinarily good studies in group sociopathology. Pirate brutality lived up to anything that we've seen in the movies and worse. Movies depict pirates who regularly force victims to walk the plank. But there is only one recorded instance of that in history, and that was in 1829, at the very end of the pirate era. Still, there were many other ways of getting hostages to talk. All of them torture. They particularly went for the captain, and if it was discovered that the captain had been cruel to his crew, they would simply cut his throat and throw him overboard, or torture him before throwing him overboard. It was a sort of, it was the pirates getting their own back, really, because most of them were former seamen, getting their own back on the people who persecuted them in the past. Infinitely unrelenting and gruesome are the varieties of pirate torture. One ship's captain tied all his gold to a rope and dangled it out his cabin window. He cut the rope just as he was being captured. 
His lips were sliced off and cooked in front of him. Another pirate would eviscerate his captors, forcing them to dance away from their unraveling guts. But there was also a slow torture, actually the slowest. Though it often had the same inevitable result. It was called marooning or abandoning on some wretched island. It was not the paradise we regard a tropical island today. With only a pistol and a Bible, the maroon man faced sure death. Marooning was the penalty that gave us one of the greatest novels of all time, Robinson Crusoe. Robinson Crusoe was uh, certainly the most famous of all castaways, but Daniel Defoe based him on a real character who was Alexander Selkirk. He was a Scottish pirate who was on a privateering expedition. He had an argument with his ship's captain who left him on the island of Juan Fernandez. Uh, he was left with a certain amount of gear. He had um, a pistol and a hatchet and a knife and a Bible, which he always maintained, kept him going through the hard times. He was actually there for four years and four days, and when he was eventually picked up, he could hardly speak any English. Wild goats left by earlier Spanish explorers were Selkirk's mainstay, furnishing him with cloaks, umbrellas, and dinner. He hunted them by chasing them off cliffs. Selkirk regarded himself as a new Adam in a new Eden. This was an era when even pirates saw themselves as modern incarnations of biblical heroes. He joyfully sang psalms to the birds and to all of God's creation. Tinge of guilt here. Like Defoe's Robinson Crusoe, Selkirk considered himself a far better Christian maroon than he ever was at home in England. In 1709, Captain Woods Rogers picked up Selkirk and brought him home. Rogers himself was a former privateer who in time became governor of the Bahamas, ruling there between 1718 and 1732. Rogers was selected because he was used to pirate ways and pirate perfidy. It was under his rule that Barney, Reed, and Rackham came to their ends. But the one who got away from Rogers was Blackbeard. Actually, for the Blackbeard story, it's not so much the life that recommends him to posterity. It's the death. Nothing became him so much as his end. That was the one legends are made of. After his ill-advised blockade of Charleston, Edward Teach knew he'd gone too far. Soon as he could, Blackbeard made for the coves and inlets that riddled Carolina's outer banks. He'd realized that he had thrown up a red flag and he was very high profile following the blockade of Charleston. And I think he came to the conclusion that it was about time to downsize the crew. So when they came up here to Beaufort Inlet, uh, he ran the Queen Anne's revenge aground out here on the bar. Archaeologist Dave Moore and his team are investigating what they believe to be the last and final resting place of Queen Anne's Revenge. So far, they've recovered two anchors and many cannons. They all suggest this was a large warship, possibly even Blackbeard's. With the Queen Anne's Revenge being located, if indeed we can prove that she is, uh, it's only the third pirate ship, uh, to my knowledge, that has been located anywhere in the world. 
So that certainly adds a certain amount of significance to this particular shipwreck, apart from its obvious association with Blackbeard the pirate, perhaps one of the most notorious pirates that ever sailed. Blackbeard consigned his great ship to the deep in November of 1718. Then aboard the adventure, a small sloop of just 10 guns, he headed for the Ocracoke Inlet. The trees over here is what they call Springer's Point. This is where Blackbeard had his hideout. There's still an old well back in there from the Blackbeard days. They had this huge pirate party here on Ocracoke, and supposedly it was the largest gathering of pirates in North America. And there was talk of fortifying Ocracoke as a pirate haven, making it into a fort. On the 18th of November, Lieutenant Robert Maynard, in command of the sloops Ranger and Jane, set out from the Chesapeake to deal with Blackbeard. Maynard knew what he was up against. But if he could bring down this malefactor, Maynard's place in history would be assured. But did he have the firepower? Did he have the guts? At night on November 21st, Maynard got the first view of his quarry. A pirate party was in full swing. But Blackbeard was alone and feared the worst. He didn't really know who it was, but he figured they'd send somebody to kill him. So he was pretty much walking back and forth all night long. And one of the, uh, uh, like Ocracoke, one of the way Ocracoke got his name was Blackbird was saying Ocock Crow, trying to get the chicken to crow the next morning so he could see who it was they sent to kill him. Morning revealed it wasn't the Royal Navy at all, but merely two minor sloops. Blackbeard laughed. What he didn't realize was that the sloops had been specifically selected for chasing Blackbeard through the shallow waters he knew so well. Robert Maynard they had to come up tack against the wind back and forth because the, the channel's very narrow. And uh, they said Blackbeard had secret channels where he knew only he knew about it, and he would trick the ships into running the grind. At first, things seemed to be going Blackbeard's way. Ranger approaches his ship and receives a withering broadside. Ten guns worth of swan shot nails and scrap iron. Six are killed and ten wounded. Now Blackbeard turns to finish off his second pursuer, the Jane, Maynard's own ship. Smartly, the lieutenant pilfers an old pirate trick, keeping his crew below deck, making it appear his little ship, too, is abandoned. Blackbeard can taste his victory. Let's board her and cut him to pieces! <laughs> and give no quarter! But wait. Surely there was more than this on board. Where's the rest of them? Where are they? Surely they be hiding. Then from the boat of the suit, we were surrounded. Surrounded by British Marines from the bow, the stern, the port, the starboard. Why, there must have been 80 of them. Oh, there could have been no more than 18 of my men left. They fought diligently, but it grew more and more hopeless. And then, and then, the sea began to grow red with our own blood. Lieutenant Robert Maynard of the Royal English Navy turns towards me, he does. I stare at him, he stare at me. And then his cowardly head swordsman snatches the side of me neck. I felt the bitter burn as blood started to trickle down my chest. Lieutenant Maynard takes his pistol and he aims that pistol right at my heart, and then... (laughs) 
my face flattened against her splintered boards. Then I heard the command off with his head. Seaman Chapman Gurley takes his finely honed sword and quickly, but oh, so carefully he does cut Blackbeard's head from Blackbeard's body. <laughs> Still, Blackbeard lives on in folklore. Even in these enlightened times, his headless body is often reported swimming round Ocracoke Inlet. It's so common a sight, these murky waters are also known as Teacher's Hole. As the 18th century wears on, Pirating declines, chiefly because more and more royal naval might can be devoted to pirates. Hard to imagine a pirate ship surviving an attack from a British ship of the line. This ship was a gun platform. She was only designed to go from A to B and to protect the sea lanes. Any pirate that came within about a mile against this ship, 140 guns coming your way, I think perhaps you might want to turn turtle and get out quickly. I certainly would. After the first half of the 18th century, pirating has seen its day. England has made peace with Spain, and the licensing of privateers, which created generations of social and nautical misfits, is now coming to a close. In a way, pirates had only themselves to blame for their sudden end. Their violence, their greed, brought the wrath of the world down on them. And no pirate story illustrates this more than that of Bart Roberts. Bartholomew Roberts was the most uh, alarming and terrifying and the most successful of all the pirates. He was not the most famous, Blackbeard was much more famous, he had a good sort of propaganda machine, but Bartholomew Roberts is reputed to have attacked 400 ships in his lifetime, and I've read numerous accounts by the governors of islands, I've read captain's logbooks, and there's no doubt that he had an amazing record of attacking ships. He appears to have been a rather stern, disciplined man, fairly good looking, he was dark and saturnine. He was also extremely savage in his treatment of ships that he attacked. Cut people's ears and noses off, and on one occasion he nailed some seamen to the mast, as an example. So, um, a very terrifying character. Appropriately, Roberts became a pirate after his own ship was stolen in 1719. A sober and orderly man, he preferred tea to alcohol, knowing it to stand in the way of his ruthless efficiency. Port by port, he swept down the African coast. At the slaver's harbor of Wita, Roberts came upon a dozen ships. All surrendered immediately, except the brig Porcupine. This so enraged Roberts' mates, they soaked her decks in tar and torched her. The trouble was, the ship had 80 slaves in its hold. A horrified onlooker reported they were under the miserable choice of perishing by either fire or water. But it was a new world, under new rules. The Empire was about to strike back. The Royal Navy caught up with Roberts off Cape Lopez in the Gulf of Guinea on February the 10th. 1722. Roberts was trapped. While his crew dragged themselves legless, Bart Roberts dressed in his finest. Crimson waistcoat and breeches, feathered hat, sash with pistols. He then calmly awaited the end. The most amazing thing is that the whole battle took place in a full gale off the coast of Africa. Gale sweeping across the decks, water everywhere.
As the unequal battle raged, a blast of grape shot tore away Roberts's throat. His constant request while he lived was that his body be tossed overboard rather than be liable to the gibbet as some pathetic moral lesson. That request was granted. The final battle of Bartholomew Roberts, the most ferocious of the pirates, was the end of an era. From that date onwards, the Navy was simply doing a, a mopping up operation. And I think what my final vision of that, the end of the great age of, of piracy, is uh, on the uh, little islands outside every seaport around the coast of the Atlantic, the bodies of pirates tarred to preserve them, being pecked by seagulls, uh, but a warning to seamen that that's what happens to pirates. 52 members of Bart Roberts' crew were hanged the greatest mass execution of pirates ever. It was an inglorious end to a mostly shameful history. There had been high points of freedom, of utopia, of seafaring equality, but most were mere dreams, mainly dreams of avarice. Their victims' ends tell a far more accurate and instructive tale. Ironically, the pirates that we are most familiar with, men like Captain Kidd, Blackbeard, Bart Roberts, were in essence losers. The successful pirates were the men who were able to operate in the shadows year after year after year. The ones that were able to make their fortunes and finally, at the end of all that, dying peaceably in bed. Buccaneering, pirating, privateering, and all manner of roving had mostly run out of grog. In the end, it's as if we, the future, have been marooned with only the lines from Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island to comfort us. Fifteen men on a dead man's chest. Yo ho ho and a bottle of rum drink that the devil had done for the rest. Yo, ho, ho, and a bottle of rum. How nice it would be if that were all there was to the pirate's story.